Today on Let the Bible Speak. What is the authority for how you practice your faith? Do we need Bible authority for the things we practice in Christianity today? We'll find out what the scriptures say next on Let the Bible Speak. And good morning. Thank you for joining me today for Let the Bible Speak. It's a great privilege to be your speaker today. For our study, we turn to a question that arose during a conversation between Jesus and the chief priests and scribes long ago. They were angry at Jesus because He had gone into the temple and thrown out the money changers. They saw it as a challenge to their authority, and they came to Him where He was teaching, and they asked this question that's recorded in Matthew chapter 21, beginning in the 23rd verse. By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, which was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say, Of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus, and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Well, obviously, both the Lord and his skeptics agreed that it was necessary to operate by God's authority. They did agree on that. They believed that Jesus was making unfounded claims, though, and was blaspheming God, and Jesus knew that they were rebelling against God's authority by rejecting their own scriptures and by substituting their own laws and false interpretations of the Old Testament. But the question asked is of great importance. By what authority doest thou these things? Does it matter, even today, whether we have God's authority for what we say and do in the church? If so, how do we discover that authority? We'll study that in just a moment. The angry scribes and chief priests were upset because Jesus had thrown the money changers out of the temple. They came asking Jesus where he got the idea that he had the right to do that. They asked in Matthew chapter 21 verse 23, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave you this authority? 
Now, they didn't want to admit that God gave him that authority because then they would be admitting that Jesus' claims were true and that he was the Son of God and the Messiah. But it was a legitimate question. Jesus well understood the importance of all things being done by the authority of God. He didn't deny that. And Jesus promised to answer their question if they would answer one of his. That was one of the Lord's most frequent responses to their veiled attempts to entrap him and their efforts to make him say something they could accuse him with. He said, first, you tell me about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? In other words, was John acting by God's authority or by his own? You see, even Jesus acknowledged that John's baptism needed authority from heaven for it to be valid. But when he asked that question, that put them on the horns of a dilemma. Because if they said that John's baptism came from God, then they were acknowledging that Jesus was the Christ because John himself pointed to Jesus and declared him to be the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. But if they said that John was wrong, well, they would be at odds with all of the people because nearly everybody acknowledged John as a messenger sent by God. So the scripture says they couldn't answer Jesus' question and that brought the conversation to a close. But the question is valid in regard to anyone who claims to serve the Lord. By what authority doest thou these things? Jesus didn't criticize or discount the question because Jesus himself cited the authority of God for the many things he preached and did. For example, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 28, he says, When Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He declared to the disciples in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, All power or authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus would not have rightly been called the Son of God had he not been speaking and acting by God's authority. But Jesus not only made the claim, he demonstrated that his authority came from God. He healed the sick, he restored sight to the blind, he calmed the angry sea, he raised the dead, he fed the multitudes with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And it was all so convincing that the ruler Nicodemus said in John chapter 3 and verse 2, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. But you see, it was not only necessary for Jesus to speak and to live by God's authority, it's necessary for us to do so as well. Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. And that means that a man is only to speak as God has already spoken. In other words, to only say the same things God has already said. But there's very little emphasis placed on authority today, particularly in religion. Uh, In fact, in the broader sense, we live in an age where men seem to resent authority, whether it be civil, educational, domestic, or spiritual. The postmodern age has brought a rejection of truth, absolute truth, and the authority inherent within truth. People therefore reject any authority outside of themselves and their own opinions. And this has had a disastrous effect on even religious people, the world at large, but even religious people. For for many years we've been told it's what's in a person's heart, not their adherence to Bible doctrine that matters, or it's how it makes us feel, not what the Bible says about the subject. That's legalism, we're told. We just need to be sort of guided by our heart and by our emotions and just be pure and sincere in whatever we say or do and everything will be all right. That's the mantra of our time. Well, true worship has been reduced to whatever draws the largest crowd and produces the most excitement as opposed to being as Jesus required in John chapter 4 verse 24, in spirit and in truth. But is God's authority as irrelevant and insignificant as some seem to think it is? Do we really want to live in a world that does not recognize nor respect authority? Think about what if we had a society with no authority? and no laws to govern our conduct and our behavior. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue if there were no set standards of measurement? What if you were to go to the gas pump where gas is advertised for so much per gallon, but it was left up to the owner of the gas station to determine what constitutes a gallon? Or say you wanted to buy lumber to build a house. Most lumber is sold by the foot. What if it was simply left up to the lumber business to determine the length of a foot? International atomic time is determined by a set procedure. 
What if we didn't have that standard to set our clocks to? You might say, well, we could get close given where the sun appears in the sky, but could you imagine in today's technological age what disruption and even chaos such a thing would cause? You see, we recognize the need for authority in the everyday affairs and transactions of society. We recognize the need for a standard or for a rule to compare things by. But what about in our relationship to God? The Old Testament book of Judges shows how God's people went through a very dark period of anarchy and spiritual decay. You read what happened in the book of Judges and some of it is even bizarre. There's not even seemingly any logic to it. Samuel identified the source of the confusion when he wrote in Judges 17 and verse 6 that in those days there was no king in Israel. In other words, they had rejected the kingship or lordship of God, and instead every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. In other words, every man became his own authority. Well, that's exactly what we see today. We see that morally in the world around us. We see it ethically, and we're seeing it religiously. People shrug and say, it doesn't really matter what you believe, or having a sincere heart is all that really matters in the eyes of God. Just be nice to people and that's all God cares about. Or if you feel like it's right, then that means it's right for you, but what's right for you may not be right for me. And so we become our own authority instead of God being the source of authority. But Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23 says, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Now, friends, stop and think for a moment about all of the things that people cite as their authority in religion and just how subjective those things are. How these things really make them their own authority instead of requiring us all to submit to the authority of God. You know, first of all, some people view their feelings as the authority. They say, for example, I know I'm saved because I feel like I am. Or I know God accepts my worship because it makes me feel right and I can't see anything wrong with it. When two or more people are discussing matters of faith, stop and notice how many sentences begin with, I just feel like, and how few sentences begin with, the Bible says. Now, when your beliefs and practices are sincerely challenged, how do you reply? Do you really think something as subjective and changeable and fickle as your feelings are an adequate authority in eternal matters? You know, if you were to buy an acre of land, what if the seller didn't have the property surveyed and didn't give you a legal deed? Would you be satisfied if he just marked off, uh, marked off some spot and said, well, I feel like this is about an acre? Would you be satisfied to walk away without a legal document and say, well, I feel good about that? Why will we demand more in insignificant earthly transactions than we do in weighty and eternal matters? And then second of all, some say their conscience is their authority. They think that something within them will, will tell them if they are wrong, and so they use this inner instinct, this inner hunch as their standard of right and wrong. Well, the conscience is a wonderful thing that God placed within us to trouble us when we sin, to warn us when we're wrong. But friend, the conscience has to be based upon something and it has to be educated by something outside of itself. People who sincerely held to pagan religions through the millennia offered human sacrifices and they did other ghastly things in the name of faith because their consciences demanded of them. There have been people down through the centuries in the name of Christianity who have done awful and horrible things thinking that they were doing the will of God. They were acting according to conscience, but how misguided their consciences were. Even the Apostle Paul, once known as Saul, devoted his life to the persecution and extermination of the church of Christ before he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. Paul himself testified in Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 9. He said, I verily thought within my, with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. And earlier in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, 
He told the council, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now you see, Paul's conscience didn't always lead him to do right. It sometimes, in fact, told him to do things that were horrible, supposedly in the name of God. And your conscience can be misguided. Your conscience can be misinformed. And therefore, your conscience is not an authority. Now, we should listen to our conscience. But when our conscience bothers us, what it should do is cause us to turn to the Word of God and check up on the matter. If there's something within us that tells us something's wrong, well, don't take your conscience as the authority, but take the warning that your conscience gives you and use it as a reminder to open up the pages of God's Word and see what God says about that matter. Is it right or is it wrong? And you know, in the course of doing that throughout a lifetime, our conscience becomes more and more educated and it becomes more reliable. But ultimately, the authority is not within the conscience itself. And then there are those who believe the majority should be the standard. That we should change and evolve as society changes. And whatever the general consensus is, that must be what is right and God will accept that. But yet from the beginning of time until now, the Bible shows us that the majority has always been wrong and not right. In fact, here is a good, good rule of thumb. If everybody around you agrees with it, it's most likely wrong. Exodus chapter 23 and verse 3 says, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Now people may say, well, everybody's doing it. This is what everybody thinks. Or today people say, don't be on the wrong side of history. But you can look back through history and see how wrong man often has been. And remember that Jesus said, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So surely the majority can't constitute the authority in spiritual matters. And I hope you're not trusting your soul to what the majority says. And then some believe that tradition is the authority. Now that is to say the oral and written traditions of the church fathers, as they are sometimes called, that these really should guide the church in matters of faith and practice today. You know, in the 16th century, the Council of Trent met and decreed that the oral traditions of the church are to be received with equal piety and reverence as the Old and New Testament. And many today believe that churches have the prerogative to interpret Scripture as they see fit and to add to it and make it up as they go along. Now, they may not state that that's what the case is, but that is what is happening. You know, for example, much of the religious world today accepts the practice of infant baptism. Friend, infant baptism is not found in the Scriptures. One of the earliest mentions of it does not appear in the Bible, but in the writings of Tertullian nearly 200 years after Jesus Christ built His church. Well, that's 200 years too late. Many doctrines, ordinances, and sacraments practiced in denominations today are the result of humanly written creeds and the traditions of the church fathers. They don't find their basis and authority in the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15 verse 3 that the Pharisees transgress the commandment of God by keeping their own tradition. And Paul warned in Colossians 2 and verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now let me illustrate the danger of using human tradition as a standard. What if I were cutting boards to build the walls of a house? And what if I used a tape and I measured the first board and then I cut the board? And then let's say I used that first board as a guide to cut the second. Now before I knew better, I tried to build a few things that way. Fortunately, they were small things of little consequence, but I soon learned that didn't work. But let's suppose that I took the second board and I laid the first one aside and I took the second and I used it as a guide to cut the third. And then I used the third board to measure and I cut the fourth and so forth. Well, do you suppose when I stood that wall up that it might be a little bit crooked? Do you think one end of that wall might be a good bit shorter than the other end? Well, of course it would. Why? Because I progressively used a subjective standard. 
But what if I measure every board by the same standard? And friend, you see, the Word of God is the standard. The only tradition that is to be our authority is that which came by Christ through His inspired apostles and can thus be found written in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Paul said, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances or traditions as I delivered them to you. What traditions was he talking about? Well, the ones he delivered. Where did Paul receive them? Were they his own? Well, look down at verse 23. He corrects their abuses in the observance of the Lord's Supper, and he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. You see, the Word of God is to be our authority, and our only authority in moral and spiritual matters. Listen to Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. He says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, Now all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that means teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, Listen now, that the man of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Well, there it is. The scriptures furnish us to every good or acceptable work in the eyes of God. And so whatever the tradition is, we need to compare it to the Word of God, not try to make the Word of God fit our tradition. The same thing is true with the church creed. Somebody says, well, there's authority in the church creeds. Well, my answer to that is, which one? Because there are several of them. Which one do you follow? And you say, well, the one that follows the Bible. Well, if it merely follows the Bible, why do you need the creed? Why not just follow the Bible? So where is your authority? Were you saved upon God's authority or that of your feelings and emotions or the creed or tradition of some church? What about your worship? Can you read what your local church practices in the New Testament? Do they carefully follow the examples of the New Testament church under the auspices of the inspired apostles in doctrine, in organization, worship, and edification? Or do you have to go back to the worship of the Old Testament temple? Or do you have to go back to the worship of David and the people back under the Old Testament to justify what you do in worship? Or do you have to look to modern or more modern church tradition as an authority? better to find your authority in the Word of God, in the New Testament, in the teachings of Christ and His apostles? What about the organization of the church? What about the edification of the church? What is your standard? Is your standard what feels good? What excites the emotions? What draws the biggest crowd? You see, Jesus warned us that in the last days when we stand before Him to be judged, He said, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge in the last day, John 12, verse 47. So that's a vital question. By what authority doest thou these things? And friend, I hope you'll sincerely consider that question today.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts, plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Well, friend, I look forward to our weekly visits, and I'm so thankful that you are a part of our viewing audience, and I hope that you will help us spread the word about Let the Bible Speak. If this is your first time to watch the program, I hope it won't be your last and that you'll make a weekly appointment to join us. In fact, maybe set your DVR, or if you're watching online, be sure to like our Facebook page or subscribe to our YouTube channel wherever you happen to be watching. You can also subscribe to our podcast on all of those platforms. Just search for Let the Bible Speak TV. Again, Let the Bible Speak TV, and be sure to like or follow those various platforms and share them as well. Encourage others to watch Let the Bible Speak. If you would like a free printed copy of our sermon today, we'll be glad to send it to you. Do We Need Bible Authority? Ask for the lesson by that title, Do We Need Bible Authority? And that free printed copy will be on its way. Thank you so much for joining me today for the program. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead and that you'll make your plans to join me back here next time if God is willing. Until then, have a great week and may God richly bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.